Okay, welcome everybody to Pacific Science Center Science in the City program. This is our first time ever we're trying to do a hot topic response into uh, science happenings that were in the news recently. So tonight we are taking on CRISPR editing, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, a few logistical details um, before we head into the event for tonight. Um, my name is Brett, I'll be your host and moderator. If you have questions at any time concerning anything around the Science in the City program, you can ask me. Um, science questions go to our panelists, or I should say our speakers tonight. I'm not answering questions about CRISPR. <laughs> um, so in general, they'll uh, probably talk about 40, 45 minutes. Um, and questions are encouraged during tonight's talk because this is more of a discussion conversation response to this news. Um, we'll also then have additional time afterwards for Q&A. Um, so in total, we'll probably run about 8 till until 8.30 p.m. Um, so just a heads up that Science in the City, if you've never been here before, it is an opportunity to join us here at Pacific Science Center for lively conversations with scientists and experts and learn about scientific and technological achievement and topics that are relevant to our city and region. So I thank you all once again for joining us tonight. Um, and a reminder that if you are not already a member with us, this is free for our members. So it's part of that membership, including, of course, you get discounts on IMAX movies, as well as many fun other events. Um, if you do need to leave at any time, and I've actually just discovered tonight that I've been wrong for an entire year, that's, you do head out, yes, to your left through the camouflage doors and then outside and downstairs for the facilities. Don't try to come back in the blue doors. I just realized today they get locked on you. So I apologize to all those who might have been locked out before. Uh, come back in through those camouflage wood doors here in the exit and you can get back to your seats that way. Um, so another talk that this group might be interested in, um, part of the Science and Civility program is that we have a sponsorship through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to bring in experts who work in global health. That happens every second Tuesday of every month through uh, next December. Um, our next one that we have coming up here on January 8th is called Making 2019 Your Year to Care, Global Health in Pacific Northwest. This is a panel with local experts who are doing work here at home as well as in a global um, context around global health. So it should be a really kind of engaging event to learn what you can do to help with um, global health. So tonight I am delighted to be trying this hot topic response and I have to say thank you to both of our speakers for jumping on the gun and joining me for this. Um, so I'm delighted to, uh, to introduce our speakers, Dr. Eva Ma and Dr. Amber Ismail. Huh? Did I get it? Yes. Uh, for our designer baby the reality, the science and ethics of DNA editing. Uh, Dr. Ma is a biology instructor and former researcher who has used the gene editing technology CRISPR-Cas9 to develop tools for studying the effects of chemicals on oxidative stress in fish. She received her PhD in molecular and cellular biology from the University of Washington, Seattle, and is currently a lecturer at UW Tacoma in the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Eva is also a Pacific Science Center Science Communications Fellow and has developed a hands-on activity to teach CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to audiences of all ages at Meet the Scientist events and her, so at the Meet the Scientist events that happen Saturdays here and in her own classroom. Um, so Dr. Ismail is a science communicator at the Pacific Science Center, helping make science accessible by bridging the communication gap between scientists and their communities to increase public trust in science. She received her PhD in biology from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and her research has focused on understanding fundamental processes in, in cells. When Amber isn't doing, doing sciencey things, you may find her training for a triathlon, rock climbing, or trying to make the perfect pizza. So maybe give suggestions to her afterwards. Um, so at this time, I would like to bring up Dr. Ma to start us out tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brett, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, like uh, as Brett mentioned, uh, this is going to be kind of an informal uh, talk, so feel free to chime in with questions, raise your hand and such during the uh, talk. I really welcome it. Um, but this is really just a chance for you to learn a little bit about this uh, gene editing system, CRISPR, and about um, the, uh, this talk topic of designer babies um, and such. And so, as you, as most of you know, uh, this really came up last, really uh, last month, that it was announced that we have uh, gene edited. Uh, uh, there's a set of twins that was born in China that they, uh, scientists claim uh, had their genes edited. Um, so it's really brought up a lot of, um, uh, you know, ethics and controversy, and really people 
thinking about uh, where DNA is heading, uh, and whether or not um, what we should do about it, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's also uh, not only the DNA of babies last month, but the scientists also claim there's another pregnancy that is underway. But this is really kind of um, it's a kind of interesting issue because uh, he's not the only one who's doing gene editing. Because even in the U.S., uh, scientists there's still there's scientists doing germline editing. Um, and the question really is like it's not if we'll expect uh, this coming, but like when and like uh, this is okay and so on and so forth. So I'm mostly going to be focusing on um, talking about the science and the um, the the science and how CRISPR works. Uh, behind gene editing, and um, and right after Ismael will we'll pick up on the story of uh, these gene editing babies. Um, so first of all, um, a double thing about CRISPR. So even though there's a lot of babies that been, uh, gene edited babies that have been in the news lately, CRISPR has is really a t uh, this this amazing programmable gene editing tool that's really revolutionized medicine. Um, so this is actually uh, if you if you haven't seen the date too well, this is actually came out last, uh, two weeks ago. Looking at uh, CRISPR, CRISPR uh, using CRISPR to study uh, lung cancer and curing cancer. It's been used uh, for many medical purposes, cancer being one of them, also um, blood disorders, so hemophilia, sickle cell, um, and so on and so forth. There's actually the first clinical trials for, uh, I believe it's called beta helicema, uh, a, a type of blood disorder. A first clinical trial that involves CRISPR, CRISPR is actually currently underway in Germany. That's uh, a U.S. Um, pharmaceutical company is actually involved in, um, and also uh, heart disease. Um, uh, this is looking at Alzheimer's. We're using CRISPR for a diagnostic tool, um, and then uh, CRISPR in mosquitoes to um, try to rid the world of uh, malaria and such. Um, they're working on malaria and Zika using this uh, method, but not just um, not just in medicine. So CRISPR is also using for gene editing in uh, agriculture. So uh, some people may have heard about this. People, uh, there's scientists that have CRISPRed out the gene that turns mushrooms brown for longer storage. Um, and then there's also um, looking at removing allergens and such from wheat. Um, a, lot of, a lot of study on agriculture. And also, lastly, uh, biofuels. Here you have uh, a head, um, a. Uh, something talking about editing yeast for biofuels. So there's a lot of applications uh, for CRISPR and gene editing. So, so we're here to just kind of learn a little bit more about this topic. So first of all, what is gene editing? So gene editing um, is, can also be thought of as genome editing. So those, those two terms are used interchangeably. Um, and, what, uh, and so when you think about gene editing, uh, we're really talking about is editing the instructions to make living things. So what is a genome? So your genome is the set of instructions to make all living things. They're found in, uh, in, the, in stored in DNA. And, and for humans, we have uh, 3.2 uh, 3 billion uh, letter spaces, and they're made up of uh, the four letters, A, B, T, C, stands for uh, the four different chemicals that's found in DNA. And really, the information is stored in the sequence of these, these rungs of this double-stranded molecule. Um, and so for gene editing to happen, um, what gene editing is, is actually trying to make precise changes in these, in, in these instructions. And so in the genome, we have genes. So genes are kind of like the, uh, the sentences or uh, the instructions for building, for essentially building proteins, which are, is the building blocks that make um, an organism, makes, makes you. And so we can think of the, uh, the, uh, the, the genome. So let's just say this is this represents a gene or a set of instructions. And as an analogy, we'll just uh, make it into something that we're more um, familiar with. Okay, so this is uh, a, a poem, Night Before Christmas. So there is an error in here that needs to be fixed. So if people can figure out the error, go ahead and take some time to look through it. And if you can fix, see it, put your finger on your nose, give you a couple of seconds to look through this. It's a little bit hard to read because the letters don't have spacing. And most, people, most people have found it. Okay, so you want to volunteer where the, uh, the, the, the error is? Can you see where the problem is? Yes. Moose. It's a moose. That's kind of weird, right? It's a moose. Okay, so there's a moose here, right? So close to this night before Christmas, not even a creature spirit, not even a moose, right? So obviously it should be 
a mouse, but when you change the one letter, right, you get something completely different. So then if this is this if this poem's encoding for a nice Christmas scene, you get something like this. And so so even like with, with your genome, a single change, a single letter change can make a big difference. Okay? And then the question is like how do we go in and change it? Okay, so so when we originally want with the mouse, you get a moose, how do we change it back to a mouse? Well, in if you have a word processor, you can just go in, you know, search it, find it. Uh, replace it, um, delete the, the extra O, put in the U. If you're looking at DNA, DNA is a, a complex chemical. You need to do a little bit more than just, uh, you, you need to search and replace, but you kind of, there's several steps involved. And you guys actually did the most complicated step, which is finding the error, okay? But once you find the error, you have to go in and, and do certain things. You have to go in and make a cut exactly where the error is. And then only after you make the cut, exactly in the right place where the error is, then you can take out uh, the problem letter and put in the correct one and then join them back together. Okay, So those are kind of the, the steps involved in, in editing uh, DNA. But what you did is you looked through, this is a total of about 240 letters. Um, but if you can imagine uh, in 240 letters, it's kind of hard to find that one problem, but uh, the one error. So if you're looking at your entire genome, so in a human, again, 3.2 billion, Basis or letters, um, it's kind of hard to find that one part and cut exactly where you want to cut. Okay. Now, the scientists are able to do this. And how do scientists do this? Okay, so how do scientists cut DNA in the precise location? Well, we use tiny scissors, of course. <laughs> so, these scissors, um, more specifically, uh, we're using DNA cutting enzymes. So, the enzyme is a as a protein that makes a certain reaction, so these are in the reaction that this enzyme does is it actually makes uh, a, a, a cut in the backbone of the DNA. Okay. But it just can't cut anywhere. So you really have to have it be targeted, which means that that enzyme has to recognize your desired DNA sequence, which means that it needs to be programmable. Okay, so something like sickle cell disease uh, versus um, uh, versus cystic fibrosis, you're going to have different sequences because they they um, they code for different things. So to have different sequences, you need to have the enzymes come in and cut exactly the sequence you wanted to cut. In order to do that, you have to have an enzyme that is programmable. Okay, so that really is the hardest part when it comes to gene editing, and CRISPR Cas9 actually um, helps with that part. Um, but after it gets cut, there's uh, there's the repair process. Okay, so after you cut the DNA. The DNA needs to be repaired. And luckily for us, our cells actually know how to do this naturally. Because you can imagine in our cells, if you have DNA that's damaged, that's really bad for the cells. Because the cells need, as soon as DNA is damaged, like, oh no, it goes into like this emergency mode. Like, let's try to sew this back immediately. Because you don't really want your information storage um, to get uh, damaged. So, because otherwise, it's, the damage can get passed on, so on and so forth. Okay. So, it undergoes DNA repair. There's actually two different mechanisms it undergoes. The first way is the quick and dirty way. Okay, there's enzymes around that senses that the DNA is broken, that oh no, emergency mode, puts it, hurry up and puts it, the two ends together. Um, it's, it's quick, it's kind of dirty, which means that it's very error prone. In putting it, the two ends together, and joining the two ends, you can get, whoops, random, whoops, sorry. Ah, there, still trying to figure out how to use this. Ah, oh, okay, sorry, you guys found it. So in, in doing so, uh, it, has ran, it puts uh, in random uh, bases or random letters or it deletes random pieces, okay? And in doing so, it tends to disable the gene by, um, with, these, with these random insertions. So you want something a little more targeted, more specific, such as if you're correcting that moose uh, into a mouse, um, you want to be able to make it, uh, the fix a lot more careful. So what you do is you put in a little bit of uh, extra DNA with the fix, the correction, and then the, the cell has other enzymes that recognize that there is a piece of DNA that with ends that match um, the original spot that got cut. And then what it will do is it will stick this fix into the, uh, into the area that was cut and in fact um, corrects the gene. Okay. So these two mechanisms uh, in the cell is what uh, makes the changes. You can, you can use this uh, method to both disable a gene and to correct it. Okay. And both of these are used for, uh, for science and medicine. Um, so the disabling the gene is 
Scientists want to study how a gene works. Oftentimes, they will uh, get rid of the gene, disable it, and then look at the outcome to see what the differences that are. And this way, they can figure out what the function is. Um, for uh, there's also the example of the the lung, the lung cancer example that I, I showed earlier. So the scientists used uh, uh, this method to disable a gene that causes the lung cancer to be uh, resistant to a lot of the uh, the chemotherapy agents. Okay, so by getting rid of that resistance, you're making that cancer more susceptible to chemotherapy. So they use this for um, for therapeutic purposes too. And of course, the uh, this way this method is used for correcting um, single uh, base pair changes or uh, letter changes and so on and so forth. Okay. So again, we come to the question of, well, this is all nice and good, but how do we get this kind of first place? Uh, and the history uh, really kind of extends uh, beyond, a re like, um, it actually you have to go back a couple of decades. So gene, uh, gene editing or genome engineering, so gene editing is actually a form of genome engineering, actually stretches all the way back to the 1970s, okay? 1970 is when they discover uh, this discovery uh, in the isolation of the enzymes that are found in bacteria that recognize and test the different sequences. So these are the restriction enzymes that bacteria, um, it used to be, uh, uh, it's thought that it's, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism against viruses, kind of similar to CRISPR, um, but they, these bacteria recognize and test the different sequences. You can't really program them. Um, they recognize like about, you know, four to six, uh, letters and that's that's all they can recognize. They can't change them. But scientists have found many different uh, enzymes that can cut in different ways. Um, so it's actually really the, the start of being able to manipulate uh, the genes. Okay? And this was actually a very significant finding, uh, no, and it was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1978. And then moving along, 1973, because they're able to use uh, these enzymes that can cut sequences. 1973 was the first genetically engineered bacteria. So it was actually a really interesting story. Um, there was a scientist who was working on these restricted enzymes. Um, he met another scientist who was working on bacteria and trying to insert DNA into bacteria. Uh, so it was um, uh, Cohen and Boyle, I believe. They got together at a conference and said, hey, let's do a collaboration. And then they wound up, um, <coughs> one guy with the restricted enzymes, the other guy, you know, they basically cut cut and pasted two pieces of bacterial genomes together and stuck it in the bacteria and they, voila, they got the first um, engineered uh, organism. So it's actually a really interesting story. So that was 1973. Um, and then later on, uh, 1979, uh, you have gene replacement used. Okay. So in the, in the 70s, early 70s, you, get, you have uh, engineering. So putting uh, DNA into cells was actually fairly, uh, fairly easy, putting, uh, but getting, uh, trying to edit and change the genes that are already in a cell is actually a little bit harder, okay? And yeast is actually, even though yeast and bacteria are both really tiny organisms, um, the yeast is a lot more complicated than bacteria. They're actually closer to, uh, their, their cells more resemble our cells than they do with bacteria. Um, so this was actually a big achievement in 1979. This was actually kind of like uh, the first step in really um, genome engineering and gene editing. Um, but then really, it kind of went uh, forward in 1985, 1991. Uh, there was a discovery of what they called modular uh, proteins that are programmable. So you may have heard the term zinc finger proteins. That's what these are. So each one of these, uh, these little yellow uh, spots represent a different module of the protein. And the protein actually recognizes um, certain bases. In this case, the first one recognized three uh, letters at a time. But the scientists were able to kind of mix and match those modules um, so, so they can recognize a certain sequence. But as you can imagine, can be, they're kind of limited in the groups of threes. But that did actually lead to genome engineering in the late 19, uh, 90s and the uh, early 2000s using these modular proteins. Uh, and then this kind of progressed uh, later in, in 2000 and, uh, uh, late 2009, 2010 where they, there was uh, another type of protein that was, uh, people were using, what's called Palin. And in this case, instead of recognizing three bases, three letters at a time, it, you have modules that recognize each single base. So now we're getting somewhere. You can take any sequence you want, take the mod, uh, that, that protein part that recognizes that and kind of mix it and match and kind of put them together. Okay. So you can actually do a lot of genome engineering with that. Um, but the problem is, it's you're still very limited in the fact that making a protein is actually very difficult and very time consuming. 
help yourself out. And getting someone else to make it for you is, is kind of very, very costly. Um, so it's actually, even though it's possible to engineer and make uh, and target any gene of your choice, it's still a very costly process. And it's not a lot of labs have access to that kind of uh, funding or technology. But really, what really revolutionized gene, uh, gene editing was the, the, the discovery of CRISPR um, Cas9 in 2012. Okay. Any questions so far? Cool. So, what exactly is CRISPR? So, CRISPR Cas9 is actually it's a very interesting story. And it actually is kind of similar as, as uh, when people first discovered restriction uh, enzymes. So CRISPR-Cas9 is actually a story of basic science where people were uh, researching um, a, a defense mechanism of bacteria against viruses. And that's kind of what uh, CRISPR normally does. Uh, and then scientists later on found the application of this basic research and, and moved it into this, you know, this enormously um, amazing tool uh, to use for medicine and all these other applications. So let's kind of look at, take a look at how Chris, uh, what the story is behind CRISPR. Um, so CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, which is why we use the uh, acronym. Um, <laughs> what it means is there's a bunch of repeats. So these are repeated sequences. So the ADTCs, there's a bunch of repeats that are found in bacterial DNA. And this was first described in 1987 by a group of Japan. So uh, this group was doing something completely unrelated and said, huh, this is weird. We, we sequenced this area and found these, these repeats, but they're spaced which is kind of odd. So they just wrote up a paper and just kind of didn't really think too much of it and just kind of moved on from there. Um, so, so, that, so, so the word CRISPR, the acronym, actually uh, refers to these repeats that are found in DNA, uh, a bacterial DNA. Um, what's really interesting is like 2005, later on, discovered that there's, in, in between these, these CRISPR repeats, there was viral DNA that's found. So what is a viral DNA doing in a bacterial genome? So the, in 2005, this is also uh, coincided with the year uh, of the discovery of CAS gene. So CAS stands for CRISPR-associated protein. Okay, and the particular CAS that we're, we want to focus on is CAS9 because this is this is the uh, the CAS that um, the CAS enzyme that is used for gene editing. But essentially, CAS is actually a whole family of, of uh, genes that encode for proteins. So these proteins are these genes are oftentimes found really close to this CRISPR. Again, is one of those, huh, that's strange. Um, so yeah, so people noted it and thought that it might have something to do um, uh, with uh, bacteria defending itself against viruses. So that was a, a hypothesis that came up because of this viral DNA that's found in between these repeats. That was the first hypothesis people came up. Maybe it's an adaptive immune system or something. So this wasn't actually verified until 2007, which actually was verified to be true that it was actually worse as a uh, bacterial immune system, okay? So what the scientists did was they took some of these, uh, these repeats, they, they, they deleted them, and found that those, virus, those bacteria are not, uh, were not protecting themselves against the viruses. So what appeared to happen is that these are little bits of pieces of the viral DNA that got shoved into this CRISPR array in the bacterial genome as kind of a memory of past attacks. So then when, when new viruses attack, they, they already have a memory of, uh, of these viruses. And what's really interesting is this, since this is part of bacterial DNA, this can get passed on as the bacteria uh, divides. So it gets passed on to future generations of bacteria. So it has this memory that's passed on. Okay, so they found out that it worked against viruses, but the question still remains, how does it do it? Okay, so now it gets kind of more and more interesting. So in 2008, CRISPR sequences, these sequences here, uh, scientists found that they make RNAs that work with the Cas protein. So RNA is uh, like, a is like a cousin of DNA. So instead of being uh, double-stranded, it's single-stranded, so it works very, uh, it's, it's very similar to DNA, okay? So what, and what they look like, they look like this. Okay, they found that each one of these produces RNAs and they somehow work with the Cas proteins. And then further on, 2010, they found that Cas9 uh, cuts, uh, the, what the function is, is Cas9 actually cuts two str those both strands of viral DNA. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So the question is, how do these work together? They found, they figured that they must work together somehow. How do they do it? Well, in 2011, okay, 2011, um, uh, this one group found that the Cas9 actually uses 
two different RNAs to target and cut viral units. So here you have the, the RNA that came from the CRISPR, but what it does is it actually holds on to another piece of RNA. There's two RNAs that come together. This RNA is actually some, from somewhere else in the bacteria. Um, they come together, and what it does is it uses that RNA to target and bind to the, the corresponding DNA, and it cuts the DNA, and this is viral DNA. Okay. And when viruses, uh, viral DNA is cut, the viruses no, can no longer uh, reproduce and thereby killing the viruses. So you can imagine if you have a whole array of these viral DNAs, a whole, a whole large number of these CRISPR RNAs being generated, you have these Cas9 proteins picking them up, and essentially it's like an army. It goes out and cuts and destroys, searches and destroys. Okay. So then this CRISPR RNA here, essentially is kind of like a mugshot for an address. So it goes and, is, I think the mugshot would be a better analogy. So it takes the, the Cas9, takes the mugshot, goes and finds the viral DNA that matches up it, and then searches and destroys it. So that's how they use it against viral DNA. Okay. But really, where the, the CRISPR story and the gene entity story come together is in 2012. Uh, a group uh, in uh, UW Berkeley, uh, Jennifer Doudna, uh, working in collaboration with a group from Germany, uh, Emmanuel Chapentier. Um, they, they came together and, and came up with this paper, which looked at and said that, okay, this is interesting. So now you have a system that can search and destroy anything. Well, what if we made this, these two RNAs and put them together into a single guide RNA, so it calls the guide RNA, and now we can use Cas9 to cut anywhere we want just by changing this part. So this part here, they call this spacer because that's where it used to be in the bacterial genome. It's about 20 base pairs. All you have to do is change that, those base, bases, those letters, to match up with the sequence that you want to. And then now, you've got Cas9 being able to go and cut anywhere. So then, and then this is really interesting, because then you can, all you have to do to cut anywhere else you wanted to cut is to just change the spacer. And, and this is also something that hasn't been done before, where you can have a single protein uh, this Cas9, this, this single enzyme, you can, do, you can cut many places in the genome as long as you have a, 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 a guide. Okay, so now you have, if you have multiple guides, you can cut multiple places in the genome. So this is actually a very, very powerful tool. Okay. So if you compare this with the previous technology, it's like the difference between hardware and software. Okay. So in order to recognize uh, and cut the DNA of a certain sequence in the earlier, protein-based technologies, these modular proteins, you essentially have to build a new computer every single time you wanted to, to cut in a place that you, um, that you desired. Versus with CRISPR-Cas9, um, it's, it's a single protein, Cas it's the same uh, computer, so it's the same Cas9. All you're doing is running a different app or a different software. Okay, so, the, so this RNA, RNA is actually very easy to, to make as opposed to protein. RNA, you can actually, you know, um, in reality, as scientists, you can just Type in on laundry online forms. You can just type in. It's less than hundred dollars. You can just you know get it shipped to you the next day. Um, it's actually very. It's, it's actually a, a very simple um, chemical reaction to put together uh, a sequence of RNA uh, versus uh, proteins. Really, you're you're looking at um, thousands of dollars, uh, five thousand to ten thousand dollars to create create a different um, protein, a different enzyme for each one that you want to target. So this makes CRISPR extremely easy. Well, relative, relatively easy for a, a lab, um, cheap, accessible, uh, and you can multiplex with this and, and target many different areas, uh, many different sites at the same time. So you can see how this tool is really revolutionizing biology. In fact, it's so easy and cheap, there's DIY kits available. Okay? Yes, there's DIY kits available. Um, I haven't used these or tried them, but I, I heard that middle schools have you know, now started using some DIY kits. Um, you can't um, you can't choose your own gene and put it in, so it's very limited to whatever they give you. So I think you can choose between um, editing genes of bacteria or yeast, but nothing beyond that. Uh, but still, it's 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 fairly simple and easy to use that even um, your middle schooler could do. Okay. So onto some data. It's actually really interesting. So this this uh, this technology, this tools, uh, uh, been around since 2012, and since 2012, things have completely uh, the amount of uh, technology has uh, grown considerably. So this is a study looking at uh, this Bichan muscular dystrophy. So this is actually a pretty, a really hard uh, disease to cure. It's a muscle wasting disease, and it has to do with this dystrophin protein. 
This tissue from protein is actually uh, the long, it has, it's the longest, it's one of the longest genes in your body. So it's really hard uh, for just normal gene therapy to correct this. So the way gene therapy works is they, they package um, a virus with a, the DNA that you want to insert in a cell and then you infect the cell. And so the virus will insert the DNA in the cell uh, and so on and so forth. But this is such a large gene that viruses, that you can't fit into a virus. And so what CRISPR does is you can actually um, use CRISPR to just edit the, the gene that's already present. So in this case, you're looking at uh, normal heart muscle of an adult mouse. So the dystrophin is in, in green. So you can see lots of green here. But one with the sham muscular dystrophy, you don't see any green here. However, after CRISPR, with CRISPR-Cas9, you actually start to see green here uh, again. And the, the, must, the, uh, the mice actually regain their function. So this is actually really interesting. This was done in 2015. It was the first study to look at um, editing uh, adult um, cells in an, an organism. And they actually repeated this. Uh, re more recently, um, they did this in dogs, and they were actually able to uh, rescue um, uh, or have dogs with muscular dystrophy be, uh, be, be recovered. So they're actually really looking forward to possibly clinical trials in the, in the future for humans. So it's a really interesting story. And you can see the, the stark difference between this one and the, the previous picture. Okay. So it's all nice and good, uh, really great. It, just, it sounds like, you know, this is this, there's this miracle tool. You can like cut anything, everything. Um, but there is a side effect, okay? Um, as with all good drugs and such. Um, so, you know, CRISPR Cas9 can cut DNA at its desired site. But, you know, the problem is it almost works too well. Okay. So, even though it cuts at different sites, um, sometimes it goes a little bit uh, awry, and it may also cut DNA at unintended sites, and we call those off-target sites. So usually you're, des you're designing your guide RNA to match this, uh, this your intended site uh, perfectly, 100% match, but sometimes um, Cas9 may actually cut at places where it's not 100% match. So it, those off-target sites can be a problem um, because you can imagine uh, if, if you have a lot of genes that are important to you and those genes have to be cut and be stable, you can get a problem. So if you're trying to cure one disease but you want to get cancer, it's not, not a great thing. And so um, scientists are working on this problem. They, they acknowledge this. Um, the, and it is actually a, a big problem with all um, these gene editing tools. Uh, but recently, uh, this is some recent stuff, they uh, try to improve this process, looking at different ways they can improve it, both in trying to improve the uh, the enzyme and the way um, that uh, the, it cuts. Okay, so they're still trying to understand how to cut, it cuts, and by doing so, um, they can find ways of improving it. And here is actually really interesting. This came out uh, at the end of last month. They're using AI to, to try to um, predict what some of those off-target sites are. So because we have 3.2 billion bases, uh, they need um, help with uh, some supercomputers to try to figure out if there's um, uh, where where CRISPR could potentially cut, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so just kind of a recap, there's all, all these creatures here, all these uh, uh, have already had their uh, genomes uh, edited by CRISPR at one point or another. Um, and there's many different applications. So for biological research, you have animal models, and CRISPR is another tool and, and can be used uh, to create additional molecular tools. Uh, medicine, we talked about gene therapy for curing diseases. Uh, drug development, diagnostics, again, mosquitoes uh, for malaria, Zika, et cetera. And then biotechnology for agriculture, biofuels, and biomaterials. And really, what we're trying to think about is like, what's the next step that's CRISPR going, going towards? Like, uh, all this work, is it, are we actually going to be adding humans pretty soon on this list as well? So, we're already doing a lot of work on human cells. Um, and apparently, in the last uh, last month, we just found out that humans are also gene edited. So the question then remains: like, should, is this uh, something that is, is it's already happening? And we're going forward. And we're, like, so we're going to learn a little bit more about what happened uh, in this particular instance, and also where we go from there. So I'm going to turn the tables over to uh, uh, Dr. Amber, and she's going to pick up from here. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, you'll want to use the wire, the wired one. Yeah, any questions from the audience? Yeah. When you talk about the 
gene drive technology? Is that the same as CRISPR? Do they overlap? Yeah. Oh. Hello? Yeah. Yes. So gene drive actually uses CRISPR. So I, I didn't mention this specifically, but a gene drive is uh, what they're using to spread um, to uh, for mosquitoes specifically. What is this? Normally, uh, for a in order for them to pass on their genes, they pass they pass one copy. They have two copies of their their genes. They pass on one copy, so only a few of their or, uh, their offspring would get the uh, would would get the desired gene or the non desired gene. Um, what they're doing with the gene drive is essentially they're putting Cas9 into their genes and making that um, and using that to edit the other copy. So then all of the offspring will have that. Uh, copy. So basically, it's a way of passing it on uh, quicker. Uh, and so with mosquitoes, they're they're doing it so that the mis they're, it can spread throughout a population in, in a very fast, uh, rapid way. So yeah, it has to deal with CRISPR because if you think about um, the Cas9 is a protein, but there's a, a gene that encodes the Cas9. So they're actually putting that gene inside in, in the mosquito, and then that replicates itself. And so it's kind of self-cutting and self-splicing itself in, and it's passing itself along. Question. Yeah. So, with the same structure of this protein, you said to create a substrate and, and rodents, and that they're working on dogs. Do, do I understand correctly that they're applying it to like adults, like dogs? That yeah. Are at the end stages? Um, so, these these dogs are uh, dogs that uh, have uh, muscular dystrophy. So, they have animals that have uh, uh, kind of similar um, symptoms that humans do. Okay, so it's actually the, the, the similar gene. So they have a, a gene that they're working on in addition. So in dogs, they're do, looking at uh, the adult dogs. Okay, so doing it in uh, embryos is a little bit different because you can. You, it's actually easier to do it in embryos and then just have it grow up and have it not have muscular dystrophy. But doing it in adults is a lot harder because you can imagine um, if you try to put uh, a gene into the cells that are already there, it's much harder. So they're actually able to. Um, Take a virus and put the genes in the virus, uh, the, the Cas9 and the the, uh, the the edits inside the virus and package it up and stick it into the cells. So then, the, so then that Cas9 gets in the cells, and so you're essentially editing the the cells themselves, not just sticking in an extra gene. So it would be instead of editing like an embryo, it would be more preventative. I mean, if the embryo is already there, it would be a little preventative to try and stop it again. But the one work they're doing with the dogs is Yes, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's essentially gene therapy, but the problem with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that that gene is so long that it can't be packaged normally into a, uh, in a into a virus that you can stick in the, into the cell. And so by doing this, they're actually having the virus edit the uh, the genes inside the cells, and that actually rescues the function. So they actually gain some function, which is very yeah, very yeah, exciting. It's mind yes, totally. Well, yes. Oh, sorry. Hey, so 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 once once a gene has been edited, so that that subject could that subject then pass on those edits to their offspring? Ah, good question. Can those subjects pass on the off? If those edits are in the germline, then those can get passed on to the offspring. Okay, which is why the whole germline editing is very is a very touchy subject because. Um, with uh, if you're just editing cells, as we call that somatic edit editing, that just affects the organism itself as an adult, right? It doesn't get passed on to the future generations. But if you're editing something that is later on going to get passed on, if you're editing something that has to do with the germline, then that can get passed on, which is why the whole germline editing for humans gets a little bit you know, fuzzy. What, can you explain where the germline is found? Oh yeah, so the germline essentially, thanks sir. Yeah. Germline essentially your, your reproduct, reproductive cells, so it's the uh, the cells that give rise to the sperm and the eggs. Uh, so, so those cells, uh, there, there's stem cells in there, so those cells get edited uh, and it gets passed on and they, they get they passed on the next generation. Yeah. And then I think you had one more question. Yeah, for the for the adult dogs that you were talking about, how is it administered? I believe it's through a a, a, a virus. They infect the cells, and then the, the so they take the virus and take the normal the viral DNA out and put the uh, the the edits and the and the, the the CRISPR and the edited DNA inside the virus, and that infects the cells. And then it's injected back in the dog. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So those are some really great questions um, that will probably help with stuff that we're going to discuss uh, now. But I thought I would be doing a disservice if I didn't um, mention how important funding for basic research was to the discovery of CRISPR and this human gene editing tool. And what basic research is, is pro are research projects that don't have an obvious medical application um, when going into it. So funding agencies, when they're trying to decide where your tax dollars are going and what research projects your tax dollars are going to fund, get to choose whether they're going to fund research projects that study how bacteria protect themselves or potentially treatments for specific diseases. And I would argue that actually both are really important um, for um, medical applications. So just to go through the history briefly, because Eva touched on a lot of this, um, when a lot of this started in the 80s, a research group first just noticed these repeated CRISPR sequences in bacteria. And they really weren't sure what they were. So they made an observation and they published this. Um, and at the beginning, people really uh, focused on these repeated sequences, but the key was actually between the sequences, I believe. And that was when they discovered that the sequences between these repeats were sequences that were found in viruses. And this was really early on when um, we didn't have these huge databases of sequences like sequenced viral DNA. So as these viral uh, sequences were being compiled, they were starting to find that the sequences between the CRISPR repeats were viral DNA. And this was done by a different group. And then finally, what they found was another group that was actually studying um, how to protect or how to not contaminate yogurt and cheese found that if, if the bacteria contained this viral DNA, it was actually protected from contamination. So that's where a lot of this came from. And then as Eva mentioned, that they found the scissors in the region of this viral DNA, and that ended up becoming what we know now as CRISPR and the adaptive immunity uh, against uh, attack from viruses. It's kind of like our immune system. It has a memory once it's attacked, it kind of stores it in its database, and then when it's when the same virus attempts to infect that bacteria, it's like, oh wait, I've seen you before, and it's able to recognize that attack and um, defend itself much quicker than it would uh, previously. So. At the beginning, when all of this um, initial research on bacteria was being conducted, they didn't anticipate that they would, it would uncover this ability to edit the human genome precisely, unlike anything we've been able to do up until this point. Um, and of course, between uh, the findings in bacteria, they took it out of bacteria and they started testing it in different um, testing outside of bacteria and then putting it in different animal cells and then this um, finally uh, being able to adapt it to human cells. So I just want to highlight that now we have the ability from that basic research, we have the possi possibility to eliminate these serious genetic diseases and so much more. And it really opens up a wide range of clinical applications and Eva mentioned a few, and I think it's just going to become um, a lot more. And a lot of this was done by some really young researchers uh, that were just really ambitious and had the drive. And people funded their personal curiosity, improvement of yogurt production, and defense against biological warfare. And some of the early research projects, these were the actual uh, reasons behind it. And it gave us CRISPR today. And with that, with the prospect of human genome editing, it raises a lot of important scientific questions, a lot of ethical questions and societal questions. And this is kind of why we're here today to talk about where CRISPR is going. Because, you know, with the new news that 
CRISPR babies or that the genome of babies has been edited, we've crossed into germline editing, right? We've crossed into editing of future generations. And we need to really, we, do, we can't take that lightly. And the scientists, when they recognize the clinical applications um, of, or the, the ability to precisely edit the human genome, they knew that this was a big deal. And this was, this had large implications and guidelines needed to be set. So in 2015, they convened at the first international summit on human genome editing. And at this summit, the scientists got together and they discussed where this was going, whether they should edit the human genome and how they should proceed with editing the human genome, whether they keep it in somatic cells, so these are not heritable edits, or we go into the germline where it is heritable and we're essentially editing the genome of the future. And we can't really go back from that once it's done. So after the summit, they kind of landed on a few guidelines. So these are just a few, like recapping a few of the highlights. Non-heritable therapy should only be used for treatment and prevention of serious diseases and disabilities. They wanted to focus on serious diseases and disabilities, and that's really important. Um, because they do not want to proceed with editing for enhancement, and um, they, they currently do not want to edit for enhancement. As Eva was talking about, editing of heritable genome needs more research. And essentially, <coughs> these off-target effects, uh, until we can make CRISPR a little more precise where we can eliminate off-target effects, um, it's not, it's not, we should not proceed forward with um, editing of the human genome until we can figure out how to eliminate off-target effects because, as Eva said, they can lead to cancer depending on what genes that are possibly edited that were not intended to be edited. Yeah. I'm just wondering, did they define what it means by serious? <laughs> no, exactly, and we'll we'll get into that. But right, it, it's it's vet, and we need to have these conversations because what's a serious disease to one person isn't a serious disease to another person. And there's a lot of gray area, right? And we need to have conversations about what diseases we want to target because some diseases we thought maybe were serious previously are not, and you know, uh, society changes. Over time. So yeah, these are great. Um, this is a great point because they don't. But, um, more they do, I believe, talk about like debilitating diseases, diseases that uh, uh, like cause pain, diseases like that. But as I mentioned, ongoing reassessment and public input should precede any heritable germ germline editing. And before. Before editing the human genome, we should it should be approached cautiously, and with that, we need to lay out strict criteria and oversight of the human genome editing. So before we proceed, once we figure out how off-target effects can be eliminated, then they need to set rules and regulations into place. But today we're here because um, a scientist has has said he edited the genome of two twins. And we don't know that he has. So we haven't known, he hasn't published his data. It hasn't gone under peer review, which is reviewed by other scientists. Um, and he's gone a bit rogue. But what exactly did he do? Because what he was trying to do was help a couple have a child that was HIV negative. So the couples that were recruited, um, and one, there were multiple couples recruited, involved having an HIV positive man and an HIV negative woman. And the way he helped these couples have HIV negative children was he in injected the sperm and essentially the CRISPR-Cas9 cassette that would make the cell resistant to HIV into the egg let the egg divide a few times, and then implanted the egg, implanted the egg or embryo of all the cells into 
the woman. And so the question is, did it work? And like I said, we actually don't know because he hasn't been transparent with his experiments. He hasn't been transparent with his data. Um, but we're at the point where people are moving forward with editing the heritable genome. So by editing this egg and basically this egg and sperm combining, we have edited the human genome and therefore we've edited the future. So why are scientists so outraged? I laid out a few of the guidelines they set out, but I kind of walked through these quickly, right? Only used to treat serious diseases. Well, for this application, scientists agreed that the risks did not outweigh the benefits. Um, and I'll get into this in, um, in a minute. Also, one of the guidelines was to approach this um, with caution. This is uh, the editing of the germline. Um, and essentially, we still are, haven't been able to completely eliminate off-target effects, and there are no rules and regulations in place for this um, because the scientist wasn't transparent about his, how he was moving forward. And finally, transparency. Uh, the announcement was made on YouTube. Um, the scientific community was left in the dark. And one interesting part that uh, I thought really stood out to me was that, and remember I mentioned the risks didn't outweigh the benefits. Well, there's other ways for an HIV positive man and an HIV negative woman to have an HIV negative baby. Um, however, it's expensive. Um, and on top of that, China has really limited access to fertility treatment. So if you really look at the landscape um, that, this, that this medical procedure was completed in, you start to wonder whether the couple felt like this is their only choice to have an HIV negative baby, whether they couldn't afford to go the other route, uh, the route of you know, sperm washing um, that is less risky than being the first person to have a crisp, like a, a gene edited baby. Um, and without the rules and regulations in place before this happened, um, this transparency has been um, questioned. And then public consent, we, we, because there was no transparency, we weren't able to have the conversation as to whether this was a serious disease that was worth um, you know, the risks that come along with gene editing and the CRISPR mechanism. Mm -hmm. Has there been the identity of the twin secret, or has did the yes. scientists? Okay, the scientists did like. Yeah, so we, I think we're body. using a photo of two babies. Those are not those. Okay. <laughs> no one. <laughs> yes, we. No one knows who the babies are. When moving forward, when, when starting to think about public consent, um, a Pew Research study done just this year found that seven in 10 uh, US adults believe it is appropriate to move forward with editing a baby's genetic blueprint if it does um, protect the baby from a serious disease. So maybe we are moving in that direction because there seems to be um, some consensus. Uh, the majority of the public seems to think it's a, an appropriate move. Interestingly, Americans are also more likely to anticipate more negative than positive effects from gene editing. Um, and it's interesting to see these uh, two uh, research results back to back. Um, but right, if gene editing is on the horizon, or it's here, uh, there are some things we need to consider, right? Worldwide governance. It is. When you look at how um, gene editing of humans is the legislation around the world, it, it's all over the map. Some countries have no legislation, some have very strict legislation, and there is everything in between. Um, we, do we need worldwide governance? 
of editing of the human genome. What's a disease, right? What are these serious diseases? What diseases do we target? Um, I think we, we need to have conversations about what diseases are worth the risks of editing the future genome. Who's going to have access? Is this, is only the wealthy, are only the wealthy going to have access to this? Because the fertility treatments in, you know, as they are now um, suggest, uh, you have to have, you have to be fairly wealthy to have access to these fertility treatments. And, you know, this might be one of the reasons why the couples agreed to um, this risky study as well. Cosmetic enhancements, should we move forward with cosmetic enhancements? Elimination of species. So I think you briefly got into gene drives. Uh, releasing a species that has selfish genes um, that can essentially eliminate the species of mosquitoes that can harbor or uh, spread Zika, that can spread malaria. Is, should we be wiping out entire species just to protect, the, protect humans from these diseases? Is it worth it? Um, are there any other ramifications that we're not thinking of that would come if we eliminate a species? Can we turn that gene drive off um, once it's released into the wild? Uh, these are questions we really need to consider. And finally, discrimination. If we can edit our genome and at some point, is it going to be asked whether you have a specific gene? If you don't have a specific gene, can you be discriminated against? Is it the next, is it the new eugenics? Is there, these are important things to consider. All right, and these are the negative consequences of gene editing that we think of when we're like, yes, we need to move forward with human gene editing to prevent these serious diseases. But wait, what about all of these other um, considerations? But there's one question that I always come back to with you know, this list of possible negative effects and things we need to consider. There's one question that I always come back to, and that is, if the technology exists to cure a serious diseases, is it ethical to not move forward with that? Because people are suffering. And if we can prevent suffering, should we? And that's a question I think you guys have to ask yourself. And we probably need to have conversations about how to move forward, because likely, in my opinion, we're probably going to be moving forward. Um, so thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Um, and we'd love to answer any questions you have. Um, here. So you guys, you know, show us all these cute little PowerPoints, you know, with the little cartoons. How do you, how do you, um, how do you know when there are unintended consequences? What do you see? You, 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 you inject it into an organism, and do you just, how, how do you know when it's, when it's gone off target? How do you detect that, other than mathematical modeling? So scientists are, uh, are able to sequence the entire genome. Um, and so a lot of the off-target sites are able to de detect it through whole genome sequencing. So you do like a before and after. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's actually one of the, the harder parts because um, some organisms have more variation. So the question is, is the off-target, is something changed due to a variation or that was naturally there or something that Crispr did? And so that's, uh, that's also what makes kind of off-target a little bit hard to discern whether or not um, something happened. Right, but, but there's definitely ways of detecting that. Um, and I think whole, um, sequencing the entire genome is one of the more um, thorough ways to figure out all the off-target sites. And actually that's part of, um, I think, what went into the, the development of the AI model, models was looking at these whole genome sequencing events. How long did it take to propagate through it? To go through? Well, the technology, I don't know how many, how many it's our time, how long it takes us days? It's getting so When you inject a dog that has that has a disease, how long does it take for it to propagate through? 
Uh, I don't know. Like so uh, the research I've done with, uh, with zebrafish, I injected into um, uh, one cell embryos, and it's pretty instantaneous because like once they grow up um, in a couple of days, you can actually see the effects already. Um, and, and so it, I think that it happens uh, pretty rapidly. Um, in terms of uh, the sequencing, I know uh, it's, the sequencing is getting much cheaper. So you can, uh, for humans, you can get your whole genome sequenced for like a thousand dollars or so. Um, so for dogs, I think they have fewer, um, I'm not really sure uh, the amount of time or the cost for that, but they're able to do it's not much anymore. Yeah. I mean, compared to what it used to be. Yeah, so technology is there to really look at, at these things. But that's why people are um, so, <laughs> scientists, if you can get it down to a single cell, it's so much easier. Um, if you're trying to, if you're trying to change all the cells, um, having the, as few cells as possible, because you have to change a lot less copies. And if you're dealing with adults. Um, yeah, that's why actually germline peel, uh, uh, editing is so appealing, because you're doing it at such an early stage that you know that the CRISPR will get passed onto more cells and such. So they do a lot of that for research, but certainly you know, for, for humans. This is, yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the possible consequences is considered mosaicism, that um, the cells are different. Some are edited, some are not. And if you don't, um, prior to this, a lot of the people were, um, were going through the CRISPR, uh, they're trying to CRISPR in fewer cells, but it was still a ball of cells, and they they're, they weren't getting all of the cells. So I think they going that's why going down to a single cell was is really the key. And I think that's where the germline editing is going. So, can the uh, CRISPR Cas9 continue to affect the genome after you get like your after picture? Does it only go through it once, and you get off target like later on after you do your after image? Good question. So the question is, can the CRISPR-Cas9 continue to um, edit in, uh, in the genes? So it depends. So if you inject uh, uh, CRISPR, well, CRISPR, or if you're injecting uh, Cas9 as a protein, and proteins don't last forever. Okay, so you inject it into a cell, uh, it does this thing, but over time, that protein is actually going to you know, wear out and no longer function. Okay. Uh, but if you're injecting the gene for Cas9, that can um, last a lot longer, and that's actually where the gene drive comes in. So if you're actually putting the gene of Cas9 into, uh, in, into um, say, uh, an organism, then that can make more Cas9, and that can continue editing. Okay. But what's interesting is that um, there's actually ways to turn, scientists have now figured out ways to turn off Cas9 as well. So with evolution, um, since bacteria have evolved CRISPR to attack viruses, well, viruses have kind of evolved ways to go against the CRISPR as well. So they, their viruses have found, there, there's been uh, studies that show that there's uh, proteins that are found in viruses that attack the Cas9 to prevent the Cas9 from attacking that. And so there's different ways of, um, of turning off Cas9 that scientists are also starting to use as well. So you can actually control how long a period of time the Cas9 is active for. So, question. I mean, that's tough. Like, and so that's the limitation of CRISPR, right? It, it's easy if you just if if you can just target one gene or a couple genes, and you also have to have the research behind the disease to know that okay, it's this one gene or it's these this like handful of genes that are, are that can be easily targeted um, without knowing. Uh, the mechanism of a disease, it's, it's going to be a lot more difficult to uh, treat. Yeah. 
So piggybacking on that is that the, the initial diseases that scientists have uh, chosen to work on are ones that are very well characterized and they have um, a certain a mutation, like one mutation that they know that can be easily fixed. Uh, so something like very, that are complex diseases like autoimmune disease might take um, longer and also depends on like the, the finding behind um, people studying that, right? So it really depends on a lot of factors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bacteria. Uh, you said it grows big and precious and the distributed means should transfer RNA into the region aided by the mitochondria and into that nuclear box. Does that mean this is theoretically the gut mitochondria? And if so, how close are we with that counter transfer to the gut mitochondria? <laughs> 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 Sorry, another question. So the question is, uh, with all these uh, DIY kits, can it be weaponized and such in the future? Um, the DIY kits is very limited, um, so you still, <laughs> luckily, um, so you still need to have the knowledge of trying to, uh, of you know, of knowing what target to use and making sure um, this this is matched up. There's actually a lot of rules that I didn't even mention. It's not actually that easy to just create a, a guider that works anywhere. There's actually a lot of rules that follow. So it's easy relative to a lot of other gene editing methods, and you can get DIY kits, but you're kind of limited to that kit. Uh, but that being said, that is actually a big concern: is people using uh, CRISPR Cas9 for like bio weapons, right? For biological weapons and such. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that would definitely be a concern. And so, especially with, um, you know, um, putting, say, yeah, again, using viruses, but also you think about, like, what if we, like, cancelize it or something? I mean, that could be, like, a pretty, you know, awful situation. And that's actually one of the, uh, one of the concerns of, you know, the, the founders of CRISPR is, like, well, what, it's, it's so, quote, unquote, easy that if it gets in the wrong hands, what's gonna happen, right? And that's kind of the, the question with any of these technologies, when it gets in the wrong hands, then where does it go from there, right? So yeah, so then you have to hurry up and make the antidote to the CRISPR, right? <laughs> so. Right in the middle. So right now, are there any actual laws in the US against gene editing that just happened in China? <laughs> I, um, I didn't get into this much because it it kind of leaves your head spinning. Um, here's a map of the the world. <laughs> I they actually only I um, the oh it doesn't say here. They only surveyed I want to say it was like thirty or forty countries. Um, and as you can see, it's it's a broad spectrum. In the U.S. So the U.S. regulations, and, and, and along with all these other, along with the other countries, like whether it was illegal in China, it it's not really clear. Um, as far as U.S. what um, how I think it stands now is, you can't receive any federal funding for um, germline editing, but there's no legal ramifications. So if you have your heart set on it and you have enough money to proceed forward without it, um, I think it's possible. I, I mean, I don't think you're breaking any laws, but you can't use tax money or federal money for, right now they want to they approve of, in their, of research on um, germline editing. I think that's going to, that's going to um, proceed uh, with a, and that's where I think it stands now. But I think a lot of this is going to be readdressed soon. Can I throw in the fact? Yeah. If you're using uh, viruses as the delivery system, is there any risk of them mutating, or do they not get enough generations for that to be a problem? So the virus, is, so the question is, uh, are we using viruses as a delivery system? Um, for, yeah, so for, for, for um, trying to get, uh, for gene therapy mostly, people still use viruses. But these viruses are, um, are already essentially deactivated. They, they take away the virus um, genome, and what they have is just replacing it with, uh, they, they essentially serve like as a vehicle to deliver something, because right? viruses are really good at delivering 
uh, infecting cells and delivering whatever it is they have encased in them. And so in that sense, they're not really propagating themselves enough to be mutated. So the, the, the mutations that come with viruses is that viruses propagate themselves over generations, which is a very short time for viruses, and then acquire mutations. So that would, uh, that would not be a concern. So, question about um, okay. So this so the supposed twins that we have in China that are um, um, you know, super twins, whatever they are. Um, you, you mentioned that the the, uh, the parents may have been too poor to to try another uh, another method of of having uh, HIV negative offspring. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. So. If, if this is a cheaper methodology to do it, um, this could potentially be dangerous, no? I mean, if you have um, these genetically enhanced humans, um, and uh, we don't know really if they can, if, if, if they could um, maybe become cancerous, or maybe they can, may or may not live a full life, May or may, may not be able to procreate. These are all questions that that are just we just don't know the answers to. Yeah, we don't know. Uh, huh. It hasn't been verified, um, as well as the the scientists said. So right, we all have two copies of every gene. One twin, um, and this is from the scientist. One twin had both copies um, edited. One twin only had one copy edited. Um, so it wasn't flawless, even in his own words. Um, whether you know, he claims to have sequenced their entire genome and you know, confirmed that there's no off-target um, editing, but that also hasn't been approved, that hasn't you know, been peer-reviewed. Scientists haven't sifted through um, those data to really verify that. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a dangerous use of this technology where it stands right now. And, and this is where the ethical and the controversy really comes in. And the scientific community basically has a consensus that says that no, he should not have done it because it was clearly kind of reckless at this point. But not to say that this won't happen in the future. But right now, there's still a lot of um, things that need to be ironed out. There's not enough um, trials, not enough um, really not enough experiments yet to really move it forward, but this scientist kind of jumped the gun, so to speak, um, which is why the uh, scientific community is like really not happy with, with this, this set of experiments. But not to say that this won't happen 10 years from now uh, with you know something else after it's been tested to make sure that there's no off-target sites and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, just to play devil's Exactly. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah. So exactly. So the, yeah. So the 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 the, uh, the um, other point is that somebody has to be a first, right? And so the, and this might be the only the only way that the couple could have children. Uh, and so in the sense that he's doing this, is he helping this, this couple have a child? And if you watch his the announcement on, on YouTube, it he he really at least in the video, you know, really wanted to help this couple have a child, and they, this is the only way they, they thought it was going to be possible. Um, and he wanted to help them do that. So I, I think he really wanted to do good. I think it was just, he, he wasn't transparent about that. It was, it was too soon. It wasn't accepted by the wider community. Um, but yeah, this has, really amazing implications for uh, preventing, you know, disease or people who, you know, who suffer. Yeah, um, kind of further playing devil's advocate since we're kind of optimistic about this whole thing. Um, it seems like you can at least minimize the fears a little bit of passing on unintended genes by the fact that there's, you know, a 20 to 30 year lag time when you can do further research into it before they'll actually be having their own kids, twins, you know, if they have their genome edited. 
there was an RP off target had it been that had unintended side effects, can they not be edited again in 30 years? Who knows? <laughs> um, my, my thought is, is this going to create a space for ASAP, right? Somebody has now said, I've done this. And is this going to turn other scientists who are maybe also in questionable states of mind or questionable states of research or questionable what have you, they see a benefit in it and they push it forward, right? I want to be the first that really can say this, right? Where scientists at the end of the day, unfortunately, are, can be egotistical. We're not all that way. But there is, right, that sort of ego that plays with it, right? So do you think once maybe the data is published, do you think this will give rise to potential much quicker movement forward than, say, should we watch, right, in a, in a logical state of mind, we should watch and see what these happens with these twins, but will we? Or will we move forward? I mean, you, I, I guess you go either way. Uh, my gut says someone had to be the first. Um, I think they will come. I think laws and rules and regulations will come. Um, but I think it's going to move. Now that this has happened, I think it will move forward faster. Then that's just my opinion. And that's what the scientist says about it. He makes it, uh, Lee Shin Chu and Lee Brown was the first IVF baby. Like someone had to be first, right? So yeah, but I think, you know, in a way, if these babies do wind up being healthy and perfectly fine, it does, I, I believe it really does open doors to a lot more, you know, editing and such in the, in the future. So, but it's really, I think it's not just like a, if we'll see, it's just when we'll, we'll see this happen. Because it's definitely moving forward. Yeah. Uh, oh, ma'am. Okay. How about some interviews and So the gene that was edited was um, is a, uh, a gene that um, has been found to have um, differences in some humans versus others, and those with uh, a, a defect in this gene tend to not contract HIV because it's one of the ways that the HIV gets in the cells. So it's not only protecting the, the kids right now um, from, uh, so it's not just so that the kids are right now HIV negative, it's also that it prevents them from getting HIV in the future. If it was confirmed that this, the, the babies did have the, tar uh, the targeted gene that the scientist said that it was targeted. Okay. The problem is it's not really verified whether or not that actually was complete, it was actually what he did. Right? Um, but the other thing is there's also stuff that's still unknown about this particular gene. I think they said that uh, with the gene editing, that they, he may have made the kids more susceptible to some other disease, maybe it was like malaria or sickle cell or something. Wait, what is you remember? It? What is the disease? It, it's, a C, it, it's called a CCR5 gene. Yeah. 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 And I don't know if it's the only access point of HIV, but I think it's one of them. So I don't think yeah. it's completely so, preventable. But they also did, I think, in addition to. Um, mutating this one gene. They also took, I think, the other precaution of uh, washing um, the sperm as well. So I think they, it was multiple, it was layered. It was my understanding. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Picture of a future where we have global guidelines, or do you picture a future where we have CRISPR tourism, like we have cosmetic surgery tourism, <laughs> alternative cancer tourism, we could go to get your genes edited and driven this way. Are we going to have like uh, CRISPR tourism where you can go get your genes edited? Um, I, I, in terms of the, like designer babies, or are you talking about like in, in general? I'm thinking the sort of alternative cancer. Clinics in Mexico. Where you can, oh, cancer you clinics. You go and have doctors who aren't necessarily following what we in the States would call the straight and narrow. 
Ah, yes. So mm -hmm. whether or not people are going to go to places where they are doing the CRISPR thing, uh, I, th that really has to do with the access to the technology, right? So there are countries where you can get access to the technology. So let's just say in the future you are able to get your, you know, your cancer cells edited and be cancer free. Yeah, I could totally see, you know, but again, it's the access, right? So can only people who are wealthy have access to those or not? Um, and so yeah, those are the things we have to think about. But eventually, if that does become available, it just it just becomes another um, another way of treating a disease, right? So if, if it, in the future, if this becomes so mainstream, it would just be another uh, alternative to treat disease. And then you know, in the future, probably then they also go down and so on and so forth. Um, but um, in terms of actually like having to design your babies and such, I it's it, I, I imagine that a lot of the um, uh, the germline editing is, is going to start in like the fertility clinics. Okay, it's not for um, just you know anybody just wanting to have a designer baby. It's like it's, it's really for um, people who have specific diseases that otherwise can't be cured in other in other um, in other methods, right? So if you have a, a horrible genetic disease, and um, but then there's also other ways of screening for that, right? People do genetic counseling to try to prevent that from being passed down and so on and so forth. So it's a good question. I'm not really sure what the what the future holds. And eventually if it, if it becomes you know more mainstream, people are accept it, it, it just might be another another method of curing disease. Like they they take antibiotics or something. Maybe not that people, but in the back. So um, it sounds like the somatic uh, editing is a lot harder. And do you think that they're just gonna uh, like abandon that and just focus on the um, the, the baby editing, or, or, or do you think that there's... Yeah, so, so somatic is a lot harder, but uh, if, but say if you have a disease, um, you can't just be a baby again, right? right. So so um, even though it's easier doing babies, there's definitely a lot of somatic uh, cell editing because that is kind of where how you treat diseases of people who currently have it. So like the Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy, um, you can actually easily correct it in an embryo, so the embryo won't have it. But then, as an adult who's you know, or a, a grown-up um, person who has the disease, you really want to be able to, you know, cure the disease, right? So then, so then that makes somatic uh, editing very valuable. And, and, and you think they're going to make a lot? They'll still make progress on that. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So this, uh, so this, uh, what's really interesting about this muscular dystrophy uh, story is that, is that they are able to do it on adult cells, which is actually a lot harder, and which is, is actually very promising because the people who, it's, it's a muscle wasting disease, so it kind of appears a little bit later in life. Um, so yeah, so it, it is very, it is very promising. Okay. And there's also, you have to take into consideration, um, if you're editing, you know, from a single cell stage, those are probably parents that have realized that they have a disease that they could possibly pass down. There are also diseases that aren't that aren't spread that way. So you could have a random mutation <coughs> that will cause you a disease. Um, you know, a cancer that you know didn't you know you, you didn't start out as a single cell that had this mutation, but you this mutation arose later, and you still need to uh, and treating that disease is. Uh, you would have to do it in um, somatic cells. So I think both ha are valuable in our society, and I think um, likely we'll proceed forward with both because you know sometimes diseases or sometimes mutations arise, you know, far down the line, or you know your parents know the parents know that they have a like a disease they could pass on. Um, yeah, so in, in, in one case, germline editing is really valuable. In the other case, uh, it, it wouldn't be, yeah, it's not valuable. So you can't prevent everything that way. Okay, can we get a question over on the left in the red? And then I'll come you back. You can get her question okay. first, and then come back to Barbara's question in a second. Oh, okay. Well, I, I was just going to ask um, I mean, realistically, we know that there's already gene therapy for severe combined immunodeficiency disorder. So, um, when you think about how this is actually going to be applied in the U.S., say, for example, where we have some regulation and where people do not want to destroy embryos, what would be the next step? Is it going to be like treatment of cancers, maybe bone marrow cells that can be reinserted into consenting adults? 
Is that like our likely next step? Because I think the MJR thing is going to be a hot button issue for a while. Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, so so the embryos aside, yeah, I think something like taking um, your your cells, editing them, and putting them back in is very doable. So that's actually what a lot of um, cancer therapies currently are, are basing their cancers on. You take the cells out, look at the cells, look at the what mutations your cells have, find a treatment for those cells, and put them back in. So yeah, there's definitely been a lot of uh, work on editing the cells outside of you, and then possibly, you know, putting back. I, I'm actually not too clear of whether or not there's actually clinical trials going in that route, but I'm sure that that's stuff that's on, on people's minds. Um, the clinical trial that I think I, I mentioned earlier is, um, there's, a, there's a clinical trial on, uh, on looking at uh, one of the blood disorders that's occurring in, in, in Germany. So I believe in that one, they are actually taking the blood cells out, editing them, and putting them back in. I'm, I'm not too sure uh, what, what the nature of that is. Um, but there's definitely many ways you can apply CRISPR to uh, and gene editing to the different uh, therapies and such. And so if you imagine if it's a blood disorder, if you take, say, you know, deep bone marrow and get the blood stem cells, take them out, edit them, and put them back in, that could, you know, be a, a lifesaver for um, people with certain diseases. I can, I can see that going on. My question is actually maybe a question more for the audience, but I was wondering if we could actually do a poll about what people think about this and about whether people think that we should use gene editing to... Okay, so I'll, I'll leave this. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could leave this. So, and obviously you can not answer if you don't want. So your question is, who in this room would go ahead with gene editing on the germline or just in general? I don't know. Oh, wait, let me see question. Who is comfortable with gene editing? Who is comfortable with gene editing of the germline for future generations? Now, or like right now, <laughs> or like ten years? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> ten years? Would we have better regulations? Yeah, ten years. So remember, this this out only came out in two thousand twelve. So it's yeah. actually. It's only six years, and we've already gotten so far. So this is actually, yeah, it's amazing. This is after I left grad school. And like, all of a sudden, like, whoa, where did this come from? Because <laughs> what used to be like the entire career of a grad student is now like can be done like, you know, two months. <laughs> it's a new grad student to their entire grad school to create a mouse line. But yeah, it happened. Yeah, I mean, seriously. But yeah, it's only, it's only six been six years, and already they're doing so much. In fact, like, um, so Cas9 is almost like, like that, that was yesterday's news. They're, they're actually looking at other CAS, um, CAS proteins that may even function better and more precise and such. So uh, they, have, they have their um, uh, uses. But yeah, they're, they're, there's actually, it really opened up, that, that paper in 2012 really opened up the doors to, ex to explore um, not only using um, this technology, but also kind of learning more about this technology and how we can use it in different ways as well. So it really is amazing considering that's only been six years, um, how far people advanced with this technology. Okay, I think I'm actually gonna end it there since we are at 8.30, a little bit after. Um, but I do wanna say thank you everybody for joining us tonight for an interesting ethical science uh, discussion about CRISPR. Um, let's give our speakers a round of applause.